God is love. The Bible says, uh, let us love one another for love is of God. He that loveth not knoweth not God because God is love. Love is a substance. Cast all your cares upon the Lord. Cast all your cares upon the again to the Lord for all things. While you're standing, if you will turn to the book of 1 Corinthians 13. 
we will read together a very familiar passage of scripture but a good reminder beginning at verse 1 though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity I am nothing and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity it profited me nothing charity suffereth long and is kind charity envieth not charity vaunteth not itself is not puffed up doth not behave itself unseemly seeketh not her own is not easily provoked think it no evil rejoiceth not in iniquity but rejoiceth in the truth beareth all things believeth all things hopeth all things endureth all things charity never faileth but whether there be prophecies they shall fail whether there be tongues they shall cease whether there be knowledge it shall vanish away for we know in part and we prophesy in part but when that which is perfect is come then that which is in part shall be done away when I was a child I spake as a child I understood as a child I thought as a child but when I became a man I put away childish things for now we see through a glass darkly but then face to face now I know in part but then shall I know even as also I am known together and now, and now abided faith, faith hope, hope charity. charity these three but the, but the greatest, greatest of these is, is charity. charity amen precious father again we are coming to you knowing that the need is great, our need is great, and your supply is wonderful. We honor you and thank you for the congregation here. We thank you, Lord, for the audience and the TV. And Lord, for everywhere this word is going out, I ask for a special grace and anointing upon the word of God. And let it do what, Lord God, normal words cannot do. Let it destroy yokes, let it heal, let it set free and inspire. Oh God, let it bring revelation knowledge in the precious name of Jesus, for you are the word. Lord, supply the need, supply the spiritual need through the word of God. Encourage us again today. Illuminate our minds and our hearts as your word comes forth by opening this word. I thank you. And I give honor to you. For it's in Jesus' name I ask. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you and you may be seated. What a familiar passage of scripture given to the church in Corinth by Paul, the apostle. Paul wrote many epistles. Perhaps most of the epistles uh, of the New Testament. And a few were written by James, Peter, John. But God is good. And as we are reminding each one of us today about the supremacy of love, there are a lot of things we encounter in life. There are a lot of things that we involve ourselves in. But nothing compares to the supremacy of God's love. God is the example set before us by sending his son to a people, a universal people that were enemies and aliens in our mind toward God and his son. But he sent him to die for us. That we might live. God wasn't satisfied knowing that. The whole creation could go into a lost eternity. 
He loved so much. He cared so much that it moved him to become very sacrificial in his love. Love is sacrificial, you know. It's very unselfish. And so God displayed that, his only son. He didn't have a lot of sons. He had one son, and that was Jesus. But just the quality of love that looks beyond the human fault and frailty and see their need. Our need was life. We were dead. And the only way that we could receive life was through God's Son. And He gave His Son that we might live. So He's the example that we must follow. He gave His life as a payment for sin that we might receive life again and have fellowship with God. That's love. That's love. And so Paul writes, there were some bickerings, some divisions, some feuding, some misunderstandings, some glorying. And in the process, he addressed several things when you look at 1 Corinthians. But in chapter 12... 13 and 14, actually it started in 11, but 12 began to talk more specifically about the gifts. And someone says 13 is sandwiched in the midst of them. But chapter 12, at the end of the chapter says, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. There's something about God's love that simply speaks volumes to humanity much more than anything else can speak. And God is calling you and I to a higher plane. We've lived, I can speak for myself, we lived time and time again on a plane that was not the higher plane. We've walked according sometimes to our understanding, to how we felt. We've walked that way for many years, but the higher road is not like that. The higher road is giving of ourselves and extending a hand when we don't necessarily want to do it. Is looking beyond human fault and frailties and seeing their need and reaching out to touch that need. God is calling us to something more supreme than prophecy, something more supreme than, than philanthropy, something more supreme than all the things that he mentions here in this chapter. And uh, we, we want to pay attention to that. He mentions, as I said, many epistles here. And this is one of those epistles that can just sort of makes you stop and think. But as I read this epistle again a few times in the very first two or three verses, uh, points out the supremacy of this love. And in Ecclesiastes, you no know, Songs of Solomon, chapter 8, I think it is, verses 6 and 7, uh, when God, through Solomon, was depicting Christ's love for his church, he said something, and I'm going to read that. If you would like to turn to Song of Solomon, chapter 8. You can follow with me. Song of Solomon says... 
Verse 6, set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is strong as death, jealousy is cruel as the grave, the coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it, for man would Give all the substance of his house for love. It would utterly be contemned. Now although Solomon was displaying his love for the Shumanite woman. His bride. God was through this. Talking concerning the love for his church. God loves his church. We know that. Just uh, um, eros kind of love certainly can be quenched. Brotherly love sometimes can be quenched. It can be hindered too. Most of the time if you love somebody, if they continue to do you wrong, then that brotherly love will, will wane until it becomes non-existent. But the agape love works differently. And this is the love that Corinthians is talking about. So I find that love is the preeminent thing containing noble properties. That's what he points out in verses 4 to 7. And it abides permanently. It provides the answer to the age-long question. What is the supreme good? That's love. It's the supreme good. Power of expression. One writer said power of expression is not determined by diction, phraseology, and style. It is determined by depth of heart. Love is character. As I thought about it, as I was meditating upon it, it's what I was reminded. Love is character. Love is character. Love is the substance. Uh, when a person is singing, when a person is speaking, when a person is reaching out, doing uh, a lot of good deeds, charitable deeds, love, love is the substance. So it means that the, the, the motive behind all that is being done, it must be loved. When God heals us, the motivation is his love. He heals us. Whatever he does is motivated by his goodness because God is love. Love must be our aim in life as children of God. It must be our aim. We must aim at it. Paul said during his time when he wrote uh, to Timothy, he said, some aim and their goal was not love. So if you don't aim at something, you're certainly not going to hit it, right? Love must be the aim, the goal, the target that we're aiming at when we get up in the morning from the time that we get up to the time we lay down. Every word, that, the words that we speak, the actions that we take must be based or must become rooted and based in love that we are going to give to others and see the supreme good. God is love. The Bible says, uh, let us love one another for love is of God. He that loveth not knoweth not God because God is love. Love is the substance. It's the substance in a person's life that gives them the weight, the durability that he needs. And uh, at first I had a problem trying to understand some of these acts of charity. How a person can really do that and not love, but it's possible. It's very possible. But as I was thinking concerning that, and he reminds me that love is character. And then he reminded me of the Pope. 
And I got kind of tickled because I saw uh, back here probably a couple of months back. They had him on the news where the Pope, uh, someone uh, reached out to touch him and touched him. I pulled on him. And uh, he got out of character. And, and, and I, I was telling my wife just kind of, you know, you see the Pope like this. He moves so graceful. He looks around and he carries that aura about him that he's holy, separate, you know. And when people say the Pope, you know, the eyes of the secular world, it's just like, whoa, the Pope. So there's a, one, there's a wonderful appearance. But what was funny was when the woman reached out and pulled on him and touched him, Instantly, he, he forgot that he was the Pope. And here's what happened. And the media caught it. And so the Lord reminded me, <laughs> love is character. Isn't that right? Love is not some phony projection, you know. Some mystical seemingly that, you know... You know how people walk around heavy and mystical like this, you know, they're steeped in the word and all of that. But love is character, it's kindness, gentleness, long suffering. That's what God's looking for. He's not looking for wordy people, isn't it right? He's looking for people with such a relationship with God. That they become Christ-like. And Christ becomes formed in us. By way of union and communion. Right? Association. Bring on assimilation. How many believe that? It is true. Sometimes stories told of a family that had a good son or daughter and that son or daughter got with the wrong group and spent quality time and next thing you know some behaviors start to manifest in that child and all he was doing was listening associating and mingling and it's that way when you mingle and associate with the Lord the more you do it the more you listen to him the more you take heed, whether in prayer or abiding in the word, we start to take on that nature because the nature is already in us, but it doesn't always have right away like it should. This is one of God's great concerns for us. And I was reminded concerning love. Just on yesterday, I'll tell this, it just kind of bless me. There were those going out to witness and uh, my, my thing is this is I don't want anybody to go out that are not accustomed to it and it uh, doesn't matter. I'm not limited to one time going out during the month. If someone new is going out and want to witness and we don't have sufficient amount of those that to help them then I'll just go whether I went last week or week before. I'm concerned that they, if they want to go and should go, that they have someone else to go with them. So to make a long story short, we had gotten in and, uh, from tremendous effective mission. We're out of town for a couple of days. God wrought some wonderful, wonderful um, deliverance and healing. And uh, so we came back and then on that Friday, we had another thing that God had given us to do. So it was, we was pretty tired coming back. And as we came back, uh, and then Saturday trying to get back, uh, get our body rested and everything, and I think I got up early and then fell back asleep around about 10 or 11. And, but um, there were some newcomers, new for the first time, I guess some were. And just knowing that they were coming, I forgot to check with Tor to find out who might be coming to, to sort of make sure that there's someone there to 
be there <clears throat> for them. And so well, the girls took it upon themselves just to give us a rest, knowing that we had come, been on a mission and just got back to rest. Just took it upon themselves to go out. And uh, I knew that was a tremendous victory for my daughters, but it really blessed me. And um, it blessed me a lot. But all week long, the Lord had been just kind of dealing with us about the supremacy of love. And that was just one of those things that I said, you know, that's really good. So when we can capture a selfless life, we can operate in love and people will get to see and taste of the unconditional love that God wants them to taste. You cannot perform unconditional love in a selfish manner. It won't work. It's totally unselfish. I was tickled when I, one day I got, felt real spiritual and I wanted to ask, said, okay, God, I want to win souls. This was some time back. I want to win souls. You know, I haven't won souls. I need to win more souls. And I just, so in, every day, talking to the Lord. So I sat down to eat one day, just hungry. Someone called, and there was an opportunity. I was so hungry. But it challenged what I said. You know what I'm saying? And all I had to do, I could always have eaten, but I'm saying this flesh will always challenge Love. Because love is not of our own selves. It doesn't come from our own selves. So we're always, we are actually always given opportunities to demonstrate the agape love of God. And so when a person, according to First John, when a person has developed in that area of learning to die to themselves and Christ living God has actually accomplished his divine purpose for that life he is satisfied that that person understands what God wants I saw your care. Father 